Hola, Kulez. We're back again with another episode of Offside, a video podcast on YouTube. But as promised last week, we want to take a look at one of the other candidates for the Barca coaching position. Obviously, all this is at this moment speculation. We don't know who it will be, but these names have been floating around in social media. A couple of weeks back, we talked about Flake. And this week, as promised, we are going to do a deep dive on the name that unites a lot of the Barca faithful, Roberto De Zerbi. Barca fans largely see De Zerbi as someone who is a good appointment, someone who can actually build something at Barcelona. And he is, I don't, don't want to say everyone's favorite, but he's at least in the top two, I would say. If you look into the Sassuolo De Zerbi or the Brighton De Zerbi, they've slightly evolved over time, but mm. he still uh, likes working with a double pivot. He still wants his pitch wide. He wants wide wingers. He likes short possession games. He likes inviting the pressure. He likes isolating to overload. Things that Xavi Fernandez himself likes a lot. Things that many players in our teams cannot do very well, especially the, the defensive midfielder's role in Deserve's team and the double pivot, the way he uses it, correct? Which are problems for Barcelona. And I don't know how much Barcelona will be able to solve that situation given the financial quandary that they're in. Okay, so here we are with the first board, and I'll start with the back line. We have a ball-playing goalkeeper, which Barcelona also have, obviously, at the moment, because the Zerbi likes to play from the back. We know this, and he needs a goalkeeper who is comfortable making connections with these players right in front of him. He can be very vertical when the, he is required to, but he's also someone who is proficient in playing the ball short and keeping the ball under intense pressure as well. Now, the centre-backs, again, very straightforward. They have to be brave in possession, and everything flows through them. Fullbacks are very interesting because everything depends on the player. If this is Balde or this is Cancelo, things change. It's the same w was with the Zerbi as well. Initially, these players are very wide, which means that they will hug the touchline on, on the sides here and they will create these angles for the ball playing center backs to access them. However, the fullbacks in the Zerbi's system, they have the same roles in the first phase. In the first phase, the left-sided fullback and the right-sided fullback have the same responsibility, which means that if this was Balde and Kunde or Balde and Cancelo, for example, they would have the same role in the first phase. Regardless of the profile, regardless of the individual characteristics, they will have to do the same thing under the Zerbi. And that's the kind of the beauty of the Zerbi because he will create, he will mold those profiles. If Balde at the moment is not able to do, the Zerbi would coach him to be able to, right? So that's the big plus with the Zerbi. He will mold the profiles to get them to the technical level that he needs them to be in to put forward his ideas, to, to execute his game more. Right? Now, the sixes, the double pivot, the Zerbi is a bit different than what is currently popular in, in, in modern football because he likes his sixes to be these low center of gravity, diminutive, traditionally Spanish, let's call them, uh, number sixes who are not necessarily big eaters of ground. They're not really physical per se, but they are more astute on the ball. They like to have the ball. They can turn and, and exploit all the angles and they need to be very proficient in ball progression, which means that these players will move left, move left, right as needed to, and they will have to be able to connect with these players here and progress the ball forward rather than being this shield or these physical specimens. They have to be technical monsters. That is the highest or priority in the Zerbi system when it comes to number six. So, in theory, Barca would have everything they need for the double pivot under the Zerbi because he doesn't require them to be these big, broad Declan Rices or Chouamenis or Rodris of the world. He needs them more to be the Pedris and the Gavs of the world, so, which is good for Barca at the moment, right? Now, the attacking midfielder number 10 is not someone who traditionally creates a lot, not someone who traditionally carries the ball or dribbles or takes or creates a lot of take-ons. It's more of a second striker or goal scorer profile, which means that this player needs to be very astute in how he moves. He needs to be able to connect with the players in the final third, but also he needs to have the eye for goal. He has to smell the goals. He has to move well inside the box, and he will be the one who supports the number nine the most in the final third, both in terms of the link-up, but also interchanging positions and knowing how to move and when to move. So this play right here, doesn't have to be a, the biggest creator of all, but he has to be a goal scorer. Someone who doesn't take that many touches potentially, but he uses them really well. Now, the wingers, 
they stay wide initially, as you said, they like, they need to provide with, they are with providers in at first, but the Zerbi also love to have wrong footed wingers, which means that this will be actually right footed on the left and left footed on, on the right. And they will eventually cut inside and they will have this direct profile, which means that they have to be runners. They have to be able to exploit space, but they also have to be very creative on the ball, which, which means that the Zerbi's wingers are responsible for a lot of creation in the box. They will serve the number nine and the number 10 really well with their in-swing crosses and they will leave the space behind them for fullbacks and then they will interchange with fullback. So wingers under the Zerbi, they get a lot of chance to be creative, to create, to, to be this force from the wings that cuts inside and then interchanges with the players there. And that brings us to number nine, who is, I put a model number nine because I don't, don't really know how to explain it, but this player has to be clinical inside the box. Of course he has to be, but he also needs to know how to move and when to move to create space or exploit space and do the link up, do short link ups and lay the ball off into the sides, into the, into the runners, if that's a fullback or a winger. And he needs to be someone who can bring the intensity as well, because the, the number nine under the Zerbi needs to challenge the center backs, needs to be able to fight with them and win duels with them, but also be intense when attacking the space, when dropping and creating the space. One of the things that Derby very much focuses on, and his teams do very well, is the third man. Now we have heard about the third man. All of us know what the third man is. But these triangles that you create at every juncture of the game, wherever the game is, right? In Xavi's Barcelona, Xavi also wants to do the same. But you'll often see, especially in the midfield, we don't really have those triangles being set up. We just lose formation. And what happens is verticality ensues, as you have said many times. Deserve is also vertical after a point of time, especially in transition. But that standard or structure of playing with those triangles consistently around the ball for the player to find that additional passing system always stays. It always remains. How will Barca be able to do that, given that we don't currently? And the second thing is in Deserve's systems, mostly the CBs play a lot of role in the box crashing. So the wide wingers come in, as you rightly pointed out, they cut in inwards. So they create the 10 and the 9, obviously box crash. And then the CVs also put a lot of emphasis into that box crashing, correct? How does that fit in within this structural framework? That's a fair question. And I think that we'll talk about this more when it comes to the build-up phase and the final third phase. But the goal is to create this, what we call the hourglass shape. So the center backs are wide, right? So they, if they're positioned here on the sides or on the edge of the box, the number sixes will come a bit closer to create this diagonal passing lane, right? And then the number 10 will move a bit, a bit wider here and the number nine will drop over here in the half spaces, right? So what you have now is an hourglass shape that we like to call in football. It forms right there. If we form this one and we add another one here, it's an hourglass, right? So what this does, it enables those triangles that you mentioned. It enables diagonal passes into players because now all of a sudden this ball playing center back, who has to be, of course, a proficient on the ball, he has a much, much easier time in accessing this player or accessing this player because he has to send a diagonal pass. And the body position is different because this player can also receive uh, in a head on, sort of a half turn way and then immediately play the ball forward. And then again, when he receives, the same thing happens higher up the pitch. Again, this player is in the half space and he's not forcing the six to make a vertical pass, but rather a diagonal pass, which is much, much easier to, to execute. So the positioning in relation to your teammate, not in relation to your to the ball or the opponent, or your teammate. So they need to know where to position themselves in every situation in relation to teammate. And that's what this hourglass shape creates because it gives you easier ways to access your teammate and creates those triangles that you talked about, or he creates diamonds as well on the sides right. and enables those overloads. We'll talk about that more a bit later. Now we come to the Barcelona equivalents. And this is the fun part because I feel like it matters which players perform these roles. I have full confidence that these players will be able to perform the roles that he requires in a different form eventually, if not immediate. Starting from the back line, Ter Stegen is someone who fits, right? He's a decent shot stopper, but he's also very proficient with the ball at his feet. And he needs to be that under the Zerbi. That kind of is very straightforward. 
Now, Kubaris and Christian are both playing center backs. I think Kubaris especially would be very important in bringing forward the idea of the Zerbi's uh, football to Barcelona. The Zerbi could bring Araujo to the level that he needs to be, being the conductor, being the controller, being the hub of the buildup of this team. And if he can do that with Araujo, then we would have a very complete profile in our hand. Now, Balde and, and Cancelo and Kude, I think they, w- they would be the preferred choices because Balde replicates the Estupinian role, role under the Zerbi. He would be someone in the first phase who does the basics, the same as Cancelo and Kunde. But then when it comes to the final third, the Zerbi will give those profiles the freedom to express themselves. Cancelo, Cancelo and Kunde will be able to form these connections really well. They would probably crash into the midfield a bit more. And then from here, they will be the distributor, the connector, the link-up player rather than being the overlapping presence or the carrier or the runner ball on the other side of the pitch. We talked a lot about Barca missing that complementary profile next to Frank, next to Pedri, next to Gavi. However, I think that the Zerbi would easily deploy Frankie next to Pedri or even Pedri and Gavi in a double pivot because they fit that, that 360 angle midfielder who can progress play, who can turn against the pressure and be the fulcrum of the team. And then we come to the uh, number 10. And I feel like Gundogan can fits this best because he is someone who has an eye for goal. He is also creative, so he can do things on the ball. But he can also score goals. And I think that would be the main thing for the Zerbi for this number 10 role, just behind Lewandowski or Ferran Torres. Connect with them, move upwards, occupy the box and score goals. Now, number nine is tricky because... Lewandowski would be the first choice, obviously, and he would score but lots of goals. I'm sure that he would score a lot of goals under the Zerbi because the Zerbi's teams create a lot of goal scoring chances. However, the things get complicated when we start analyzing things like dropping deeper, asking questions of the center backs and being this intense presence off the ball, but also bullying the center backs. Can Lewandowski do it? Potentially, yes. At, at the same time, we've not really seen this consistent side of him. And finally, we had the left wing. And this is the tricky part. And I'm going to ask you a question, Dev, here. Who do you think would be the ideal left winger for the Zerbi in this current Barca squad? I don't think we have any. I would have gone with Rafael Liao. But oh, that's yeah. not happening. I don't think Felix can do that role, to be entirely honest with you, based on what we have seen of Felix. If you remember the Porto game, what Cancelo did, if you put Cancelo up there, probably there is a chance. I think the only player who we have seen perform something remotely similar, I I would say it's Cancelo. You know what? You just hit hit the nail on the head because, yes, I think the only player who can perform this role is Cancelo, actually. The reason is none of these other players, Felix or even Ansu Fati, even Vitor Roque, even Ferran Torres, none of these players, or Fermin Lopez, none of them fit the winger profile that Zerbi wants. All of them would actually be right here. Right. So second striker, Felix, Gundogan, um, Ansu Fati, Vitor Roque, Fermin Lopez, they all fit under this mode right here. The, the number 10 role, the second striker goal scorer role. And Cancelo is the only one who has the creativity, he has the trickery, as you said, he can do that role and he can cut inside over here and allow Balde to overlap if needs be. It doesn't make maybe that perfectly, but he fits the profile, the, fits the needs of this team. One other thing that, that we have to mention here is that the four midfielders experiment doesn't exist anymore. Under the Zerbi, that is not an option. He would never do that. He would never play Gavi or Pedri on this left wing. So you have Frankie, Pedri, Gundogan, and potentially Gavi on the bench, or someone else on the bench, depending on what the Zerbi feels is the best thing to do. But there are ways to actually fit all four midfielders onto the pitch at the same time. This is, Gavi is out of position. What happens in possession is, now you have these three midfielders, right? And when we go to the final third, we'll see this later, one of them will put forward. So we'll get this, for example, Frankie would move close to the, to the pitch and Gavi would invert next to Frankie right here and Balde would invert here and now you get traditional Deserbi Shakhtar formation which is got 2-3 in possession when you move up the pitch and Gavi is more of a midfielder here. His task will be to stay compact with these players to be someone who can be precedent and someone who can progress play but also someone who can make those runs here as well. So basically what you, you're, you're doing is adding another midfielder here who is 
out of position, he's still a fullback, but in position, he, he he's a midfielder who, who's not providing bit. He's not really someone who can overlap here and make those runs there, but someone who can approach the half space and connect with the wingers right here and maybe attack the box as well because Gavi does have attacking instincts. In because when you counter press, the most important thing is to have your most intense players, your physically strongest players in the back, in this unit right here, unit of five or unit of four, who can counter press and who can bring the intensity, who can run and who can give you the more power off the ball, but also on the ball as well. So what you're saying is that our rest defense in a deserving structure can be Kubasi, Aravo, Frankie and Gavi? Absolutely, it can be. Absolutely, it can be. Because this is a very athletic base. This is a base that has power, it has the intensity, but also has that work rate as well. Balde, Frank and Gavi, this is a tremendous hard working line, right? So this next tactical board will actually deal with the build-up phase. So as we know, Roberto Zerbi is someone who is very rigid, who's very much about automating or making these robotic patterns, right? So that's at least that's what people see him as, that's a popular opinion on However, it's not entirely true. This is what we call an open circuit structure because it puts emphasis on problem solving and emphasis on creativity of the individual, right? So the Zerbi will give them all the patterns they need to know. He'll give them all the solutions and all the tools that they need. But then come game time, they will have to, each player will have to decide for themselves. And I'll try and explain this on the, on a very basic example. We have this brightened shape of four, two, three, one. And they are being pressed by a 442, which is a very standard way to press. So I've used this one. The Zerbi wants to activate one line of pressure at a time. So he doesn't want all of these players to press at the same time. He wants to entice the press one line at a time. So what he will do, he'll be very patient and build up. We, we heard all about his studs on the ball approach, and that is valid. But what he wants to do, he wants to play into the pressure, right? If this player right here, let's say this left forward is pressing the right center back right here. Now, where is the space? The space is where the pressure originated from. So the space will suddenly be behind him right there, which means that this player has to wait, has to be patient until the timing is right for him to access that space and be the passing option. And this is where we come to the third man principle, because now all of a sudden this space is free and we have to access it, this player will pass to that player who will then immediately pass the ball over here. And now this player all of a sudden is in a dilemma, right? Decisional dilemmas here because he doesn't know, should I do the same thing as my teammate who has decided to press, but he left the space behind him. And now because of that decision, this pivot can receive the ball in this area or do I just stay back and then have all the space and time in the world, but then he can turn, he can run at me, he can distribute the ball from this area and connect with his players. So these players all have decisional dilemmas in their head and they have to decide which of the two evils do they go for? Do they stick their position, but then leave the player in space? Do they pressurize, right. but then leave the space behind them? The Zerbi is similar to Chava in some regards, so he can be very vertical when it needs to be. He is a positional coach. He likes to have the structured way of progressing up the pitch, but he can be very vertical, especially in these wide areas right here. The Zerbi's team, what they love to do is they like to recycle play, go slowly until they can find someone who's front-facing, the players who, who are ready to burst forward, but also have less pressure on them. That means they will recycle the ball here, will go there, and then immediately go into the player who is less marked, less pressurized, and that player will explode forward. That can be in this wide area right here yeah. for the fullbacks because naturally what happens, teams tend to defend the center much more than defend the wide areas. That's why if there's going to be an unpressurized front-facing player, is likely to be this player right here or there because the wide areas are much less congested than the central areas. But the Zerbi will also love having Frankie de Jong or Gavi or Pedri because they can turn against the pressure in central areas. And that's where the value is. And that's why, and on top of not having the four midfielders, one other thing that I think the Zerbi will definitely implement at Barcelona is not dropping Frankie de Jong in the first line. Why? Because if you drop Frankie here, and all of a sudden it breaks the whole structure because it now forces 
the whole line to jump immediately and the whole principle of sequential breaking the lines kind of falls apart. But not only that, even if Frankie carries the ball from here and somehow wiggles around this player here, he still only breaks one line. Now imagine what happens if Frankie receives the ball in the second line and then breaks that second line of pressure. All of a sudden, Frankie is just one line away from reaching the box. It's much more valuable to have him start higher and turn the player in the second line, then start deeper and turn the player in the first line. There's just so much dam more damage that he can do, but also it, it defies him in the first line, defies the, the core principle of the ball always being faster than the man, right? The Zerbi always prefers to pass out of the back line because it just, it, it's faster, it's less risky, but also brings you much more value, especially if you have someone like Frankie de Jong who can turn the players in the central area in the second of the pitch. Finally, I would like to discuss the final third tactics and a bit of the defensive mechanism that, that we see in the Zerbi. The Zerbi had a slightly different approach dating back to Sassuolo days, dating back to Shakhtar days, and now Brighton, largely because the nature of those teams was different, right? At, at Shakhtar, he was a very dominant side because he was one of the best teams in the league. And that's what I feel like the Shakhtar structure is much more applicable to the Barcelona system than certainly Brighton. At Brighton, we often saw this 4-2 base. So we see this base of six players here, and that was the same in the deep areas and in the higher areas. At Shakhtar, however, we saw the 2-3 base that I mentioned earlier with one pivot and then the fullbacks tucking inside. And this is what we'll likely see at Barcelona as well. So Frankie de Jong, for example, would be here between two fullbacks. In this regard here, now, this would be the second phase. We go from the first phase deep into the, into the second phase or the final third eventually. And Balde and Kunde are deeper and they cut inside and occupy these spaces. But when it comes to the final third, there is a wide focus with the Zerbi, which means that wide rotations are very important. And it's important that his teams set the conditions for cut. Cutbacks are one of the weapons that he likes to use and he uses often and to great effect because they create good situations inside the box. What will usually happen is the ball will start with the fullback who will play into the feet of the winger, not into space, but into feet. And that winger can then cut inside, which will manipulate the space. He will drag the markers, allowing the fullbacks to overlap. And then his task of the left winger is to lay the ball off to one of these three players. So either the number 10, either the number eight who's pushed forward, or the number nine who is on the same line as the number 10, but only on the other side. And then what those players have to do is they have to play, again, the third man principle, the bounce pass into the path of the overlapping fullback, who then plays the cutback for all these unrushing players into the box. I still feel that could be potential weakness because the Zerbis teams, like Sassuolo and Shakhtar, they've not really been the best defending sides. He will insist on their in-possession principles to be so solid that they translate better to counter-pressing, they tr translate better to, to pressing as a unit and being more compact as a unit. But at the same time, I also feel like if there was a potential weakness, it could be this, because he will instruct the, the fullbacks to be very high and to push forward, and he will instruct the, the centre-backs to hold a high line. And if they cannot really track back and be this athletic presence in this Barca side and the Zerbi, there could be an issue. One particular principle of play that's missing with this Barca is the compactness principle, right? I think that won't be the case, or at least not as much, because he is very much about creating this principle, this idea, this clear game model that, that consists of clear instructions and playing in a compact unit in possession. And that then translates to the out of position thing. I think the biggest impact the Zerbi can have on the defensive side is actually improving the in possession side. All right. So we went through some of the tactical philosophies under Roberto De Zerbi. We'll get to see whether he gets to be the coach and we'll get to see uh, some version of this possibly uh, if that happens. But for now, what we wanted to do, just like the Flick uh, video, we wanted to uh, look at some of the stats. And this time we wanted to look at across all the three managers, which is Flick, Xavi and De Zerbi. So without further ado, let's keep moving. This is a comparison of attack over two seasons for each of the coaches. So what we've done is taken 
last two seasons for Xavi and De Zerbi, and obviously the 1920 and 20 seasons for uh, Flick when he was coaching Bayern. We have not taken the national team uh, stints in this. Club. If you look into it and look at the squad averages, XG, I think Flick remains the highest, followed by Xavi, uh, followed by De Zerbi. But NPXG, if you look into it from that specific perspective, I think Roberto De Zerbi has done better than Xavi. Obviously, Xavi and Flick have had better players than, than a Roberto De Zerbi might have had in the solo and in Brighton. So obviously that could explain some of the XG. Yeah. But it would seem that when you look into attacks and possibly your assist creation, De Zerbi has possibly done better than Xavi as a unit in the two seasons. And you talked about those creation of those cutbacks, creation of the box crashing that it requires and creating more chances for the forwards and the tens to score. And I think that shows up. And the fact that he could do it with a team like uh, Sassuolo or a team like Brighton where he hasn't had the best of players or so-called elite players and so on, that probably gives us some hope. If you go into the goals and assists per 90, it still remains lower for De Zerbi across two seasons, across all the coaches. If you go across XG and XA created per 90, even there, uh, a Flick and a Xavi outscore a De Zerbi. But again, it would seem that it is because of the quality of players that each had under their position more than just a function of coaching. They're all possession-heavy coaches and they all like playing the same type of football and they're all to some extent vertical. But if you look into progressive carries and progressive passes, I would have expected Roberto De Zerbi's team to have a little bit more than what I saw in the data. Now, that can be because he is possession till possession needs to be and then he likes to explode forward. The moment you get that person, that free runner, he likes to explode forward. Now, I've also done is I've looked into each coach's ability to evolve their own team over two seasons, whether they improve or whether it was regression that happened. So if you look into evolution of squad XG, NPXG, and A assists, so on to say, Flick's team actually regressed over two seasons. Xavi's actually improved over the two seasons, but Xavi's investment into year two was insane. We spent about $160 million to get people for that improvement. But look at Deserby. He spent much lesser than either Flick or Xavi from a transfer perspective and so on. But look at that improvement. At every structure of that attacking play over two seasons, right, his teams evolved and became better. So keep, let's keep going into build-up play and so on. Now, if you look into Flick, again, there was a regression. And regression happened because players left and so on and so forth. So we understand. If you look at Xavi, build-up play, there wasn't that much evolution. And this is a problem because we have seen Barca looking completely clueless when it comes to building. We do a lot of possession. We, there's a lot of possession that happens. We still have 65, 70% possession of the game. But if you look at most, most all the games, the midfield is completely bypassed, right? So the midfield doesn't have a very specific role per se in contributing to the attack or making us a little bit more of a dominating team. But again, if you look into Zerbi, each of these parameters have actually improved. Let's go to the third part of the thing. So if you look into assists per 90, goals and assists per 90, and XA and XG per 90, again, you would see there's a little bit of stagnation in both Flick and Xavi when it comes to these stats. But again, Zerbi's teams have improved. From one season to the other. Both Flick and the Zerbi have very clear game models. And Xavi has too. But I feel like both Flick and the Zerbi are the kind of coaches who can drill you more into to, to, to understand that that game model that you have. What the Zerbi, however, does, he we said it in the tactical part, he molds profiles. So he will maximize their profiles and, and that will in turn maximize or optimize the whole team as a collective. He will get stuck into it, he will drill you, he will make you evolve or reach the, the, the new heights of your profile. All right, let's keep moving. Here we have talked about XG and XB. Uh, his teams have actually improved across every aspect, all the attacking aspects of the game that we have analyzed from one season to the other. 
something that cannot be said for either of Flake or Chubby for all the aspects taken. All right, let's now move into transfers because ultimately a lot of it depends on how much money you spend, how many people you got. And with Barca's case, we know the situation that they are in. We know that we want a coach who can depend on the academy and then build a team better than a sum of its, like the sum of its parts more than individual pieces. So let's look at his transfers. If you look at the tra transfers, and here is the bought and sold column on the left, you can see Flick in two years bought about 205 million. That was his total outlay, while Bayern sold about 76 million. Xavi bought about 227.5, considered given all the transfers that have happened, loans, fees, this and that, everything. And Barca also sold quite a bit, which was 109.5. But look at De Zerbi. And this is also congruent to Brighton's philosophy. Brighton is a selling club. Their philosophy is that. So there's, it doesn't surprise me that uh, McAllister went for 60 million. So this is, says they sold a lot of people, right? And, and they made a lot of money. But the fact that he didn't really spend that much to get new players as well, 130 million, uh, I would say over two seasons, that's about 65 million per season is what we're talking about. I think perfect for uh, Barcelona, who don't really have any funds as of this moment, and we know that situation is not going to change in the recent future. Now, let's look into academies and who depended more on academies. Now, we, let's be mindful that Brighton doesn't really have an academy for, for us to do an apples to apples comparison. But if you look into that, De Zerbi has depended heavily on loans, higher than Flick or Xavi. Xavi obviously has shown a penchant for La Masia, right? But I think his hand was forced into it more than him proactively wanting to do that. I think there was a bit of both that happened. But the fact that Deserbi can do what he can through those very uh, tactical loans, I would say, specifically picked up to cover a situation within the team, that also requires that kind of scouting. Barca, as a, as a club, are in a need of a coach who's used to working the way Deserbi works. The Brighton approach is very much what, what Barca would have to implement in a couple of years to get to the financially stable phase, use his approach of molding players and also identifying players who are of little value, of a little financially expensive, but uh, they bring a lot of value to the team, right? So Zerbi can do that. He can work with what he have, what he has at the moment, but also he can work with very little incomings, right? And that's for Barca at the moment is what's most important because they cannot go out in the market, or well, at least that's what we've been told. They cannot go out in the market and splash big. And the Zerbi doesn't require that to have a functioning compact unit. And now we come to defense, which we wanted to talk about. So we have done the same thing as an offense. We have compared their squad averages across two seasons and seen which coach does the best. And then you've also seen their evolution across two seasons. So this is the averages across two seasons. And then you look into it. Tackles, defensive by zonal tackling. And then that would mean by across the three zones, the middle third, the defensive third, and so on. The Zerbi has actually done more than both Xavi and Flick. And then if you look into challenging dribbles from an attacking area where they are, where they've invited the press and they're facing a counter, but then you challenge and then you win that position back. Deserve is done better than Flick or Xavi. If you look into average blocks and intercepts, again, not shabby numbers. And then if you look into squad clearances and errors, not bad, again, from an overarching how he has used the squad, looking at this from a very linear point of view, it would seem like while there is risk and there is a question mark against, okay, with that kind of high attacking play, will he be able to give the defensive solidity that Barca requires? It would seem that compared to the two coaches that we have talked about, Xavi, the present incumbent, and Flick, uh, who has the same challenge that could he give the defensive solidity? And we talked about it in our last video. It would seem like De Zerbi might be the better choice. I would say so. And, and we talked about this because his in position is much more stable than either Flex or Chavis. That kind of translates but much better to the, to the uh, defensive side of things. And that's the, the only thing that I, I see being a big improvement and potentially impacting the, the biggest weaknesses this team has. And now we look at the evolution across seasons. So if you look at evolution again, what it tells me is that all three of them are not the best when it comes to having a defensive unit who is very much attuned, progressive, 
and aggressive in winning the ball back. Probably because they focus so much on the other aspect of the game, the tackling side of the game, the possession side of the game, uh, this somewhere gets left behind. I know we have been talking about Flick or Deserby. What if there was a point of view which said, neither, we need somebody else? There, that's definitely valid because when it comes to these defensive issues, I don't think any of these coaches actually answered those questions. So we went through the tactical parts of it. We then through some of the numbers. We uh, raised the core uh, concern that at least I have is from the defensive side of things. We require somebody to improve our midfield so that we are not clueless completely. But unless we get great strikers up front, all this attacking input might not actually end up in so much of domination and game winning because we clearly won't have the profiles or the kind of players that can benefit from that attack and can make up for the lack of defensive solidity. So with that pragmatist note, either of these coaches, they're very good in what they do, but unless Barca actually have the financial capability of getting a couple of those game-changing forwards who can create goals out of nowhere, defensive solidity is something that the team has to think about just to be relevant, just to be there in La Liga and just to have a decent run in all the other competitions. I feel like there's a lot of positives coming with the Zerbi and can he address the, the, the lack of finishing? I think he can because we have a lot of system players, system strikers who just need some patterns to rely on to be able to score more goals. We lack players, as you said, who are more instinctive in the box, who can manipulate their body and the, the space around them and angles to create something out of nothing and score even when there's no patterns that, that solidify that scoring chance, right? But with Zerbi, he would make those patterns our players and not instinctive. They need something to rely on. He would give them that base, that functioning base to build on. And I feel like that would, in turn, they, it would slightly improve our finishing problem. It wouldn't just outright solve them because, as you said, we don't really have that many players who who are capable of doing that magically out of nothing every single week. And you need something. You sometimes need those the kind of players. But I feel like at the end of the day, even with the defensive thing not being ideal with the Zerbi, he would still be, he would be an improvement. He would be a massive step forward because he would actually take this squad and he would use it the way they're meant to be used. He would not force them to be something they are not, which is unfortunately... Has, has been the case under Xavi in some situations, some scenarios where he's using these players in a way that doesn't really get the best out of them. This Barca side, the tactical quality, the profiles, they fit the idea that he brings to the table. And I think it's a very complementary symbiosis that can work really well. And I would hope so. If he is to be appointed, I would hope to see improvements in those areas. And I feel like he can bring those improvements. And the Zerbi knows how to work with very little and get much more out of that squad. And I feel like he would be the coach to work with this dysfunctional bars and try and turn it with little resources to something that's actually competitive. If you haven't, please do check out our channel because we've done a big enough and flick as well. It's detailed and, and we hope that you will enjoy it. So stay tuned and subscribe. And as we always say, Risca El Barça.